Yeah, there's something so special um, to actually talk to your spiritual family. I, I remember when I was uh, on, on the field sharing uh, messages, kind, kind of traveling around or talking at different conferences and all that type of stuff. But I like at the end of the day, I sort of felt like, you know, I know that I love doing this and this is a passion of mine, but there's something missing, some missing dimension to this. And, and it's like today, it's like that cup is full. That joy is full because I'm here with my spiritual family, longe- longevity in these relationships, and you guys are in my life and I'm in yours. We're committed to one another and we're in it for the long haul. And that is something so special, and I feel a lot of uh, honor and excitement to be here today. So thank you for having me. Um, as Pastor Mark was saying, um, this has been something, a journey for me. I showed up uh, here at the church and I was in need of, of processing a lot of past trauma, a lot of uh, difficulties that were, were happening in my marriage. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, empathy was a really difficult concept for me, and I didn't really know how to feel with my wife, which was, which was you know, causing some difficulties, um, and then others in my life. And so this journey that I s- um, set out on really helped my heart come alive, and I began to feel and I began to be able to be with people in, in deep places. And now, you know, I, that's what I do. Um, one of, I'm, a, I'm a life coach, and, and being able to um, be with someone in these deep places is really a powerful thing. Um, and it's like life. It's like before I knew something was missing, but now it's like it's life. And being able to have life is really, really cool. So... Um, I'm t- the foundational verse of this uh, series is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Um, but we all, by the Spirit of God, are being transformed into the image of God from glory to glory. I kind of simplified it, but that's the gist. <laughs> um, so my paraphrase. Now, we go to glory to, um, from glory to glory in our spirit in one way. Who knows that way? How does our spirit come alive? Yeah, he knows back there. That's right. You got it. Through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? So there's not a process. Like, it's, it's a one-time thing. You accept Jesus into your heart, and your spirit goes from glory to glory. You get life in Christ. You become alive in Christ. You were dead. Now you're alive. Um, so that's not what I'm going to talk about because... If you need that, that can be easily solved. Let's talk, let's talk after service, and I'll lead you in a prayer of salvation, and your spirit can come alive. It's, we can be transformed. Awesome. So my series focuses on the transformation of the soul. All right? So what is the soul? People commonly say the soul is uh, the mind, our thoughts, our thinking, what happens inside of our head, our emotions, Emotions have a body component, so how emotions feel in the body, um, emotions. Um, and then the will, how we, what we do with all that and kind of how we put it into practice, um, what we choose to do. And so this is about growing, this series is about growing in Christ's likeness in the area of our soul. And it's all about becoming more and more like Jesus. This, this, everything about the series is about growing more, to being more and more like Jesus. Um, So, in the soul, we're not perfect. We're actually being transformed, and we're going from glory to glory. Um, And it's a process. And so, some points in time, even today maybe, we'll have a disconnect in the area of our soul. Disconnected from God. Like, we're not able to let in the goodness of God. It's like there's something that, like, is disconnected. We're disconnected from um, our, our mind, our will, or our emotions are disconnected from, from God, right? And so that happens day to day, and I'm going to teach a process of going from glory to glory in the day to day, but also over a period of time too. And if we continually put these, um, if we continually put these pra- um, practices into practice, then I, I believe that this can help in the transformation journey. So. Another key verse is when you think about transformation, probably a verse comes up, right? Romans 12, 2. 
Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you are able to discern God's will. Now, this is going to challenge the idea of renewing your mind. I hope it challenges. Honestly, that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping you kind of get a little, like, challenged in this area of renewing your mind. What does renewing your mind look like? How do we renew our mind? So I'm going to be exploring two different strategies of renewing your mind. The, the first strategy is what I call a push strategy, push out of awareness, okay? So, right, we've got the mind, our thoughts, or we've got our emotions, the sensations that we feel. Um, and when those come up, maybe a, a negative thought or maybe a, an emotion that we're not comfortable with, we can use the first strategy, which is push out of awareness, right? Um, so that's one strategy. The problem with the push strategies we like immediately change our thinking, right? We don't think bad thoughts, we think good thoughts. Um, the, the, the problem with pushing is that we don't get to the roots, right? There's a reason, if we understood why that came up, there's a reason that if we understood it would make sense, right? And so we really need to get curious um, about what's causing this to come up. So we could push, the second strategy is what I call a welcome and accept strategy, okay? And a welcome and accept strategy is it goes towards the roots of the issue, all right? So we bring into awareness what's happening. We bring God into it. We bring people into it, and it's, it's a welcome and accept strategy. Now, it might be confusing. Don't worry. We got, we got uh, four, four sermons to go over it. But let me give you a simple illustration, okay? Think of a man who is about ready to lose his leg, okay? There's an infection, and so using the first strategy, the push strategy, that the leg is infected, and so instead of saying, oh my goodness, my leg is infected, he says, like, he just doesn't address it. He's, he stops feeling what he's feeling, he tries to disconnect, maybe uses some positive thinking techniques, right? I, um, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm healthy and whole, right? Um, but the, he has an infection, and w because he didn't address it, the leg's got to be amputated. And now this strategy gives you crutches. You can now walk healthy, and you might even tell yourself, well, I got one leg anyway. That's fine, right? So the push strategy doesn't deal with the infection or the root. The welcome and accept strategy treats the root cause of the infection. So you'd have to first look at the leg and say, yeah. I have an infection, <laughs> right? It's infected. And if I don't get help on this leg, it's going to need to be amputated, right? So then you're going to seek out somebody to get some help on the leg. And so this strategy, you go and you get the help you need. You address the wound, and the wound heals in a transformative way so that now you walk on your leg, no infection, no problems, and it's natural, easy, and you don't have to fight a battle. The push strategy, you're going to fight, 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 you're going to fight. The welcome and accept strategy, you face it, you deal it, you, you, you go through it, and then there's a transformation that happens where it doesn't come up anymore. And so uh, let me share a quick story about how I used a push strategy and what that did for me and then I, how I went. So last week when I was getting ready to come to uh, – Sunday service, I got an email, and that email was from my boss. Yeah, I don't like those emails, right? <laughs> and, and that, the email was that only two out of 13 of the students that I, I'm an international program coordinator, and so the, my students are from China, and so they, only two out of 13 had paid their tuition well, that's not good for me and my salary because I need the students who accepted and who said they were coming to my school to come to my school so that I can get paid. So what did that do? It made me start to wonder about my job security um, and, you know, the COVID situation. I know that's something common. So what emotion would have been appropriate for me to be feeling? Go ahead and, like, tell your neighbor or yell it out. Um, what emotion you think I should have been feeling? Yeah. All of it, right? Yes. Yes. Well, 
here's the deal. I didn't. <laughs> okay? Well, I, I did for a moment, but then I pushed. So I read the email. I started to feel something in my stomach. I began to feel um, a little bit of, like, uncertainty, fear. But instead of feeling the fear and inviting it and facing and dealing with it, instead I used a push strategy. And you know what push strategy I used? It's bad. I used a spiritual push strategy. I used, you know, the strategy of, like, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I used a strategy of, of do not worry about today, for tomorrow worry itself, about itself. I thought it was dealt with. I conquered that bad boy, right? And I was done. The problem was my body didn't know that. <laughs> my, my mind knew it. But my heart, my body, and my emotions, and my, my soul, it didn't know that, right? And so I thought I was doing just fine. So my wife saw me, though, for some reason. I don't know why, but she came up to me and says, Aaron, what's going on? I'm like, what? Like, nothing. I'm fine. So I went ahead and told her about the email. And she said, so, like, how are you doing about that? And I'm like, I'm, I feel good. Like, I, I'm okay. And she's like okay, <laughs> right, well, I wasn't okay, my, I, it just, it started to swirl in my stomach, and I kind of felt exhausted, so I thought, maybe I just need a nap, <laughs> right, so I didn't feel it, and instead, I pushed it, now, I love those Bible verses, don't get me wrong, I love truth, and it's, those are very important part of this transformation process, so I'm not downing on those at all, but when I used it, when I was in, when I was disconnected, then it was a push strategy, okay? So those verses can come up at a different time and it'd be a very powerful strategy. But in this case, I did not feel my fear and instead I pushed it out of my awareness, okay? That fear was still there and it was still coming out. I, I made it to church. I'm, I'm worshiping. We're worshiping about the goodness of God, right? I've got the goodness of God right now uh, in my mind, but my heart's not experiencing it. I'm kind of disconnected from what's happening. Um, and... And I just was like, oh, man, what is going on? <laughs> Why can't I worship? So I, then I thought about, okay, you're teaching this series. Let's, let's put into practice what, what, I, what you're learning. And so I stopped, and I said, what is going on? Why do I feel so jittery in, in my stomach? And, and then I realized, oh, because I got that email from my boss. <laughs> It felt like a no-brainer, but for me, it was like a, oh, moment where it came back into my awareness. And so at that point, I had to, I decided to invite Christ into it. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm feeling fear. Be near to me in my fear. Draw near. Be with me. And as I kind of stayed with it, I began to realize, oh, no wonder I'm so worried because my wife, it's due in November, and we're going to have a little baby girl, which is awesome. Eight, eight years, right? And God blessed us after eight years of trying, so praise the Lord. But no wonder I'm feeling fear, because I want to provide for this little one, right? This is like my, whole, like my whole new world coming up, and I want to be the best papa I can be, and I want that, that daughter to be provided for, Right? Of course. So in that, I'm like, oh, that, that makes sense that I feel fear. And fear, I think we treat fear as like this insidious thing that if it comes, it's like going to overtake us. When, when fear, yeah, it can do that if, if you don't face and feel it and it's acting out. But fear is an emotion that tells us that something that is dangerous is happening. And the, and the action that's associated with it is to flee to safety, right? So being able to let God come near to me in my fear, it gave me the ability to start um, understanding things a little bit differently. And so um, I, was, I got connected to that. And then I also determined that I, I remembered when I was worshiping God and God was near to me, I remembered that I had safe people in my life. Um, these relationships that I could be peer-to-peer -peer with and I could be vulnerable with and they're vulnerable with me and that I could un like undo that aloneness inside of me, that fear. And so I determined, okay, I'm going to call my friends. And you know what happened? Those two things, inviting Christ to be near and uh, 
remembering that I had a support team and uh, determining to reach out, a complete shift happened inside of me. And then I'm like, oh, the goodness of God. And I started entering into that worship song, and I, and I was blown away by that, by his goodness. And I could stand in his goodness. I had faith in his goodness. And it wasn't just my head, <laughs> right, like it was before. And also my, my body, it, it, it did so I didn't feel it anymore. And now I can stand up here and tell you the story, and I, I feel good. You know, I'm all right. I'm all right. You know, it is scary, right? It is scary, okay? But I'm all right. I'm all right. I trust in his goodness. It is still scary, but I trust in his goodness. Um, and, and then, of course, that verse, do not worry about tomorrow. Um, for tomorrow, worry about itself. Um, so, yeah, I believe that. It's, it's so true. It's a good verse. And it means a lot to me now. Um, so today's text is Genesis 2, 15 through 25. So go ahead and pull out uh, your Bible or your digital device and turn to uh, Genesis 2, 15 through 25. So this is the creation story, and in the creation story, there was different days that God made different things, right? He made the the plants, he made the he made light, he made he separated light from darkness darkness, he made um, the moon and the stars, the fish and the birds, he made humans on different days. And what did he say after everything he made? He said, It is good, right? It is good, absolutely. But there was one thing at this time that was not good, right? He had just um, proclaimed, This is good. This is good. This is good. And he goes, one thing, and he goes, this is not good. Complete, complete my sentence. It is not good for man to be alone. You got it. Good. Yes. But wait a second. Man wasn't alone. This is what we're talking about, and we'll read the verse here in just a second. Man was, was with God in the garden, walking in the cool of the day. He was naming the animals with God. He was not alone. But God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So what type of aloneness is God talking about? Let's dive into it. Um, Genesis 2, 15 through 25. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave name to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God ca caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed it up, um, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he was brought to her. Adam and his uh, wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So we can see in this verse, this is, this is perfection. This is pre-sin, okay? They had not sinned yet. Sin had not entered into the world yet. This is perfection, right? Adam had God. 100% perfect vertical alignment. I mean, talk about presence, right? Woo, he probably had it good, right? He walked with God. He talked with God. He was happy. He was, his, all of his God needs were totally met. And yet God said, it is not good for man to be alone. All right? So I think sometimes in the, in our, in, in the Christian world, we have this idea that God needs all of our needs in a vertical way. But even in perfection, that wasn't the case. Before sin, that was never meant to be the case. It was always meant for, for, for God to have a part of a human being that yearned for a human-to-human -human connection, a heart-to-heart -heart connection, a a mutual, vulnerable um, 
connection. And in this, we're talking about Adam and Eve, right? A man and a wife, which is a beautiful expression of that relationship, right? Okay, but take Paul. Paul did not have a wife. It, it, it includes Paul, right? So this isn't just about marriage. This is about a, a family. Like, it's about being put into family. It's about being put into these type of relationships that are mutual, heart-to-heart, each person sharing. You can be known and loved for all of who you are. They know, they're able to know anything about you and still accept you and love you and draw near to you, right? And so, even in perfection, Adam had relational needs, and God saw his loneliness, right? The emotion, what... Like, if Adam's in the garden, and, he's, and God says, it's not good for you to be alone, what emotion is he feeling? He's feeling loneliness. I feel lonely. So without these deep, deep connections, a part of us will feel that loneliness. But the good news is, one of our key verses here at Every Day is, God sets the lonely into family. And he did. But he, he took, you know, the rib, put it, Um, And then made Eve, and then he brought them together. He undid Adam's aloneness. He undid his loneliness through a relationship. And that's what God does for us. In spiritual family, there are types of relationships that can meet that deep need. A spouse is one of them. But there are other relationships that I'm going to be talking more about that can meet those needs. And the goal is to be naked to be naked and to feel no shame in a metaphoric way, right? Adam and Eve, they were, they, you know, that wasn't metaphoric, <laughs> um, but it also was. So in, in being naked and feeling no shame, that vulner- being able to be vulnerable and to be known but not to have shame, that is the, the type of relationship that I'm talking about. So sin makes that difficult, all right? As it did for Adam and Eve, it did, it's done for us. So sin causes us, uh, le- leads us to hide from relationships. My text for this part is Genesis 3, 8 through 10. It's probably easy just to scroll down or to, to look in your Bible. Um, Genesis 3, 8 through 10. Then the man and the, um, and so, so they ate from the, the tree of good and evil. Sin entered in the world, and then God comes to talk to him. That's where we're at. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Okay, so sin caused disconnection, right? All right, let's think about it. Adam and Eve, they had just done something, they were completely not not happy with right they did some they were told don't do this and they did it okay what do you think in the soul arena thoughts and in emotions what do you think emotionally they were feeling go ahead and tell your neighbor or, or yell it out whatever you feel comfortable with yeah so the emotion they said they fe- felt is fear and they were feeling fear but that was the fear of, like fear of being known Right? So that's not context appropriate because God is actually a God that they could share that with. So that that fear to them, what what emotion would be context appropriate? It would be, I heard somebody saying shame. The emotion sadness, grief. Grief, sadness. Um, They could have also been feeling disgust. Right? Disgust is an emotion that says, I've been contaminated in some sort of way, and I need to, and the action is to expel uh, that, you know, repentance would be good. <laughs> you know, that's a good way to expel. Um, so disgust would have been something they could have felt. And grief also helps them to, yeah, we did what we weren't supposed to do. It's sad. The garden is no longer an option. But okay, we can make room for the new. Right? So grief helps us to grieve what used to be to make room for what is now, afterward. But they didn't tell God, God, like they didn't run to God and tell God, God, we sinned. I feel, I feel both grief and disgust. I'm, I'm, I'm really like 
be with me in, in this. I did wrong. I know your character. I know who you are, and I know how you look at me. Be near me, right? They didn't do that. No, they did not. You know, at that point, God probably would have said, okay, let me tell you what's going to happen from here, all right? You're going to get kicked out of the garden. There's no way around that. Can't have you eaten from the tree of life. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in this state. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son, and I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to make a way for you to be close to me, right? That would have been such a nicer story, but it didn't end like that. Instead, they used a push strategy. So that the welcome and accept strategy would have been to bring their disgust, their their, their um, sadness into relationship, a welcome and accept strategy, but instead they use a push strategy, right? The push strategy was fear, hiding, and also blame. It was the woman. <laughs> it was the snake, <laughs> right? Yeah. So they hid instead of, that was a push strategy. They did not feel and face the reality that they were now currently in, and instead... They dismissed the infection out of their mind and just decided to go and live in a different way. So in order for us to get to that place where we're able to um, be that naked and unashamed in a metaphoric way, sense with, with certain types of relationships, um, we need something to happen. So this is, this is my point. God leads us into redemptive connection. God leads us into redemptive connection. Again, God sets the lonely into family. So, living in the light, I think, is a good concept here to talk about. This is my face and feel reality point. Living in the light is another way to say face and feel what's happening inside. So, when you live in the light, you, in, you invite all aspects of who you are into relationship with God. And one aspect of his God is his body and his body is people. And so being, being able to be known. So 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. But if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So living in the light is this, this bringing the, you know, in their case, grief and disgust, Adam and Eve coming to God and saying, here we are. This is where we're at. This is our current reality. This is our state. My emotions are this. My thoughts are this. This is where I'm at. Be near me. I know your character. I know your grace. I know how you draw near to me. Be near to me. For me, it would have been, okay, I'm feeling fear. No wonder, because I've got this sweet baby girl on the way. <laughs> right? God, be near me. And so, it does talk about here in this verse, if we claim to be without sin, then we're a liar, and the truth is not in us. So, let's not go there, and that we don't have any disconnections in the soul. That doesn't work very well. Um, but we see the two dimensions here of what we have. We have fellowship with one another and forgiveness of sins. It's a two-part thing here. Well, that fellowship with one another is that deep undoing of that loneliness. It's that it's, you don't feel that loneliness anymore. You don't feel that if somebody just knew this about me, then they wouldn't accept me. That background voice, that background program, you're able to be truly known and truly loved um, because, you're, because you are. <laughs> you're, like, you're, you're known. You are loved. So James 5, 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed, right? Confess, there's a confession aspect that involves people, both God and people, right, as, as we've been talking about. And so I want to talk about that second strategy, the push, uh, the welcome and accept strategy, all right? The welcome and accept strategy is facing and feeling in relationships. So I have this cool little chart um, I'm excited about it. Um, I'm going to be going through this in each of the four different sermon um, sermon um, series. And then I'm going to be giving it to you um, to put it up on your refrigerator. I got a postcard-sized um, chart to go up on your refrigerator. So if you want it, you can put it on your refrigerator. So anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I had a lot of fun this week making this. So, um, so we can see here. 
Um, actually, go back to the other one real quick. There we go. So before, before I get into the redemptive side of things, let me talk about the push strategy, right? So the push strategy means we push it out of awareness. We don't feel it. We're disconnected from what's happening inside of us, our emotions. We're disconnected. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not feeling and dealing. We're not facing. We're not being able to bring what's happening inside of us into relationship, okay? Like me. I felt fear. Instead of I used a push strategy. So the problem with that is you go from pushing to disconnection. So what do you think you do in a disconnected state? You push, right? So it becomes this cycle where, you, where it's like this loop where you can't get out of it. You push, you're disconnected, you're disconnected, you push, you push, you're disconnected. And a lot of people live their whole life in this disconnected state and never stopping and facing and feeling in relationship. So the way out is welcome and accept, right? That's the arrow that goes down. And when we welcome and accept, we get to this second state of the soul. So three, state one of the soul, disconnection. State two of the soul, reality. Okay? So in reality, um, we've got our first John verse where it talks about living in the light. So as we live in the light and we bring who we are into relationship, we, we welcome and accept and we stay with it until it shifts. So in my case, I felt what fear felt like. I asked God to stay with me. I determined that I was going to invite some individuals into it, and the shift happened. So I stayed with it until the shift. Um, and, and God has wired us as we receive grace, as we have, have somebody looking at us with acceptance, as he looks at us with acceptance, there, a shift naturally occurs. I'm a life coach, and I, I do this day in and day out. And I invite this kind of stuff into relationship, and I stay. And I, and I don't try to fix, I don't try to save, or I don't try to solve. I don't, when, when somebody's disconnected, I continue just to, to bring into relationship, bring into relationship. I don't say, here's a Bible verse. Not at that time. I love Bible verses. But at that time, I don't do that. Instead, I stay. I stay with them. And I allow what is the reality to be, and I invite what's in reality into, into relationship. I welcome and accept. And it goes after the roots. We deal with the roots, and then, then there's an automatic shift that occurs. So this living in the light it connects us, and it undoes that aloneness. And so we can see now that we go into state three, which is connected to God, people, and the spirit-led self, and it leads to spirit-led transformation. And so as I was able to then now receive the goodness of God, now I was, the Bible verses come up inside of you. Now you can stand in the truth. Now you can have faith in this place of connection. So it's important not to skip this, the step of facing and feeling. So now, some of you might be kind of nervous when I'm talking about all this facing and feeling in reality. Here's what I'm not saying, okay? What I'm not saying is, for you to air out all your dirty laundry to, all, ev to everyone in the church because they're your spiritual family, and you're like, here, look. I'm not saying that. <laughs> That's just weird, <laughs> okay? It's strange. You feel strange. They feel strange. You really don't want to be in their life. You kind of pull back. So that's not the type of relation. I'm not just saying to do this. I'm talking about that type of relationship that Adam and Eve had. It's, that, it's, it's the difference. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So to explain it, I want to make sure that I give you a clear understanding of who I'm talking about, and who I'm not talking about, okay? So who I am talking about is coaches and comrades, okay? A coach, and I'm going to talk about it in, the, in spiritual family, so, it's, so that's my context specific. You can use this for other things, but for a coach is like a spiritual father, spiritual mother, someone who's in your life um, and who's helping you walk out this journey of your faith. These are safe people to talk to. Now, if they're the only ones you have, then you don't have that mutual, that peer-to-peer, -peer, and you're going to have aloneness, that you're still going to long for, for that deeper connection. That is not enough, okay? It's really good, especially when a baby's really young, like to have, you, you know, they only have coaches. They don't really have that co-equal. So when, 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 you, when you're younger in the faith, You'll probably have more coaches, but as you continue to grow and develop and mature, you're going you're gonna to still have coaches because that's nice. You have spiritual fathers. But as parents do, they launch their kids out, right? 
and they, 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 can, they launch their kids out. And so we want the second type of relationships to be our mainstay, the ones that we're connected with. And that has to do with a heart-to-heart, -heart, it's mutual vulnerability. So coaches, it's a one-way street. They're there for you, and however you need help, I'm giving you my full attention, I'm working with you, but this isn't about me at all as a coach or you know, spiritual father, this is about you. All right, that's beautiful, it's a great thing, and that we all need that type of relationship. These are grace gifts, these are beautiful, you know, the more that we grow in Christ, the more that we have capacity to do this for people, it's amazing. But we'll still have that loneliness without the second type of relationship, which is the comrade relationship. So comrade relationships are those where it's mutual vulnerability. You're vulnerable to them, they're vulnerable to you, and it, it fulfills that deep longing. So those are the, the three people that I called to talk about my fear. And when I did that, I actually asked one of them, what was it like for me to call you about where I'm, I'm currently feeling fear, this isn't past, this is a current reality, and to tell you about what's happening right now in my life. And you know what that person said? They said, oh my goodness, I feel super honored. Like, I didn't know we could do this. Like, I didn't know we had permission to like be this vulnerable, and it empowers me now to want to do this in my relationships too. And I, felt, and I felt warm, and he felt warm, and we had this warmth and this connection. It felt really, really good. Um, and so... That's a comrade relationship. Now, we got to be careful not to mix up comrade relationships with a close relationship, okay? Because the problem is, is in our families of origin, maybe we had what was a close relationship, not quite that level of vulnerability in which the parents were more, vul you know, more vulnerable and being able to feel all the different emotions and face all the different emotions. Instead, they used push strategies. That's okay. Sin's in the world. We all do that in some ways, right? But so... A close relationship is one where we're having fun, where we're doing fun things together, we're doing passions together, we're, um, we're, we're going out and doing fun things together. And that feels really good, and it can feel like a comrade relationship, but it's not. And your heart will still long for that deeper connection, even though you can have amazing relationships in your life where you do all the things that you love to do, and yet still have a, a loneliness inside. And so we do need comrade relationships um, where it's that uh, mutual vulnerability. My wife is one of my comrade relationships, okay? That, that's good. But she's not my only comrade relationship. Let me, let me say this. If I told my wife, sweetheart, you're the only one that I share all of my issues with, how do you think she'll feel? Not good. <laughs> like, Get out. You know, like, I can't handle it. You're like, that's too much. I don't even want you to do that. I want to be a part of it, but I don't want to. That's called dysfunctional relationship. And a lot of relationships are like that. Marriage relationships are like that, where it's a dysfunctional relationship where you try to get all your needs met in one relationship. It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be, um, so she's one of my relationships, but three to ten relationships where you can be this open and honest. Also, you have to be careful because there's relationships where people will take on your offense or take on, they'll, they'll get stuck in your content and sucked into your world. Those aren't the type of relationships you're wanting to, to do this stuff with, okay? They need to, you know, work through some stuff and get to a place of, a, a little bit safer. That's okay. Everybody's on their journey. Maybe coaches right now are better um, for that individual. So the individual that you're looking for is someone who's able to stay separate from you and they're able to stay with what's happening inside of you, your emotions. They don't try to fix, save, or solve you, but they're with you until the shift happens, and then you can, you can do it together. You can, you can figure out a way of what, what's going to happen. They can, they can give you high truth needs and high grace needs, but high grace is really what you're looking for. I'll talk more about high grace and high truth coming up. Um, okay, so what is your next steps? Uh, our practical next steps is I wanted to challenge you. So... The biggest problem is that we don't, we're not aware of our needs, okay? When we're not aware of our needs, we can't have comrade relationships, okay? No needs, no comrades. We all have needs. We just have to get in touch with them, right? So my, my first challenge is get in touch with the need. And my second challenge is to identify an individual who is a comrade or who you would like to be a comrade and reach out to them. Okay, 
the type of person you're looking to doesn't try to fix, save, or solve you. They, they give you their full attention and say, tell me more about that. Like, they, they're there with you, okay? Um, and it might be difficult. Maybe, maybe there's, you know, I don't have anyone like that in my life. I completely understand. Um, I've been there. I've lived a lot of my portion of my life without those deeper connections. Um, so I wanted to, one, invite you into microchurches. That's a good, that's a good um, context for that. Those, you can check those out out there in the cafe. But I also wanted to talk about um, giving of myself to help people to learn how to do this in that deeper way. And so that's why I wanted to invite you into a uh, tr healing transformation microchurch. And that doesn't substitute for a microchurch, but it's, it's something that we have 12 weeks of 30 minutes of, of teaching like this, and then an hour and a half of experiencing of what I'm talking about, where you have that whole body experience of transformation, and it's really amazing what happens. So there are um, applications in the back for that. Uh, there's only like 20 applications, so if you're highly considering doing that, go ahead and take one. If you're not, you don't need to. Um, but fill that out and return it to me next uh, Sunday, um, and we can do that. But as a church, let's grow in this together. So um, I want to pray before I, before I dismiss. So let's, let's just uh, invite the Holy Spirit here.